cloud. And now I'm going to admit everyone. Morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. We'll just wait a little bit um, as people trickle in a couple of minutes. Fabulous. Okay, well, wonderful to see you all again. Welcome to those of you who are new to the series. Um, welcome to uh, everybody who's been coming along all these weeks. Um, yeah, this is the LSE Anthropology Research Seminar in Anthropological Theory that this term pays tribute to David Graeber our colleague and friend. I'm Alpa Shah, I'm a professor of anthropology and I'm chairing this series uh, this term. Um, before uh, I introduce this week's session, I'd like to remind you, uh, you'll have had an email note, um, but I'd like to remind you that next week's seminar uh, we have cancelled in solidarity with strike action that many staff are undertaking between the 1st and the 3rd of December. A dispute uh, with the university bosses over our pensions, pay and work conditions. And um, the presenters for that seminar, uh, Nanika Mathur and Michael Hertzfeld, who were to be discussing bureaucracy, uh, are going to make available their presentations um, as written text on the FOCAL website for this feature, um, for the feature which is around the seminar series, uh, alongside all the other texts for the series, but there will be um, no seminar, so just to remind you, remind you all uh, about that. Okay, so um, let's turn to today's um, seminar. Uh, it's really my very great pleasure to introduce you to the three presenters who will make two presentations this week. Uh, it's actually a rather different session to the ones that have gone before or the ones which will follow, which all discussed one of David's key texts. This week, we're going to hear from three postdoctoral fellows who all came to know David as doctoral students in our department though none were um, formally supervised by David, and who today um, are going to try to trace the influence of two key um, anthropologists for David. Uh, in an essay um, where he begins by how his ideas, this is David's ideas, um, have been influenced by Morris Block, who opened our series, David made the point that ideas emerge in conversation and never from the independent mind of a great thinker alone. And in this seminar series, we've already discussed the influence of Marcel Morse, Pierre Clastres on, on, on David, amongst others. 
And today our speakers are going to explore the influence of Terence Turner and Edmund Leach uh, on, on, on David. Um, we're first going to hear from Julio Ongaro and Megan Laws about the significance of myth for David and how David's ideas on myth developed from his teacher, Terence Turner. Uh, it's particularly wonderful um, for me to have Julia and Megan on uh, to, uh, speaking with us today because they've been co-organizing this series uh, this term uh, and are both co-editing the Focal feature that will archive this series. Um, Julio uh, is currently an ESRC fellow in the department for his doctoral work uh, in our department, he conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Highland Laos among the Aka, or a group of uh, non-literate Sweden farmers. His work lies in the areas of medical anthropology, shamanism, and ritual efficacy. He's also conducted research and published articles within the science of placebo effects, dealing with the philosophy of mind and cognitive science, and is currently writing a short book on the global history of medicine and a series of papers on the phenomenon of collective intentionality. Julio recently wrote a glowing review of the dawn of everything for Tribune, also published on, in, in Jacobin. Um, Megan Laws is an LSE research fellow. For her doctoral work, she did field work amongst the Ju, Ju, Juhatsi, um, uh, or otherwise known as the Kung in the Kalahari Desert. Megan, I'm sure I've pronounced that completely wrong, but you will correct me. Um, she, she was working yeah, in, in both Namibia and Botswana. And her work, work focuses on experiences of uncertainty, doubt, and suspicion, and the ways these shape relationships of care amongst the Kung. She's also been conducting new work on these issues within the field of conservation, focusing on how geospatial technologies are being used to address ecological uncertainty, uncertainties and the consequences these have for people who are living at Southern Africa's rural margins. Megan had the wonderful task of, uh, of being tasked well by the department of being, um, uh, of trying to measure the impact of David's bullshit jobs um, and, and, and hence developed a relationship with David uh, through that and also through his review of her work. Um, Michael, um, so we're going to hear from Julio and, and Megan first and then after that we're going to hear from Michael Edwards. <laughs> And Michael, um, we're really super grateful to Michael Edwards for stepping in last minute because Andre Grubacic, who is supposed to be our speaker for today, most unfortunately, and for very good reason, could not make it this morning. And Michael, um, thank you for coming on board, Michael. Michael's going to share his reflections on David, the influence of Edmund Leach and the revolution in Myanmar. Michael is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center of South Asian Studies at Cambridge, and his LSC doctoral fieldwork was carried out in Myanmar, where he focused on how Pentecostal evangelists took up democratic opportunities to publicly share the gospel with Buddhist audiences. So his work studies the encounter between Pentecostalism and Buddhism in the context of Myanmar's so-called transition. Michael was also a graduate teaching assistant here in the department to an introduction course that, um, uh, introduction to anthropology course that David taught um, and, and, and knew him you know, from that time. Um, okay, Michael, thanks again for stepping in last minute. And um, with that, um, before we, list, we hear from you, Michael, uh, let's turn first to Julio and Megan on David, Terence Turner and myth. Over to you guys. Thank you so much, Alpha, for the introduction and for inviting us to uh, give this talk. So we, um, yeah, we will have some slides. Sorry, just to show you. So basically, we um, we've written this paper, and it's uh, very much in draft format. So we'll be presenting 
presenting different parts of it, but we wrote the paper together. So we're not sort of uh, presenting our own bits, we're just presenting different parts of the paper. And um, I know it does go without, go without saying usually, but it is very much in draft format and it is about uh, areas of anthropology that we're sort of only just kind of uh, coming to terms with. So we'd welcome any kind of feedback or guidance on those as we go ahead. Um, so I'm going to share my screen to show you some slides in the hope that as well that this makes it sort of easier to follow the key points that we would like to make. If that, oh, what do I present? One second. So this paper is called Towards a Progressive Theory of Myth. David's work is often described as myth-busting. His most recent scholarly work with David Wengro is explicitly so, a weeding out, excuse the farming pun, of many of the most entrenched enlightenment myths about human history and the origins of social inequality. But what we think makes his way of myth-busting particularly compelling is that it is informed by a theory of myth itself, of what myth is, what it does, and how it stands in relation to human creativity and social transformation. The study for myth, of myth for David was not an arbitrary indulgence. It was central to his overall take on the scope of anthropology. For him, anthropology was most valuable as a comparative inquiry into human possibilities, one that threw our contemporary myths into sharp relief and that was key to our own creative potential and possibilities for social transformation. Though David never published specifically on myth, the theme emerges in a variety of guises throughout his work, in the value book, in the essays collected in possibilities, and of course, in the dawn of everything. He often taught courses on myth and ritual, before his death, he had also prepared a series of lectures focused on Gregory Bateson's Naven mythical complex. Most importantly, however, in 2017, he wrote a long forward to Terry Turner's The Fire of the Jaguar, a detailed structural analysis of the Kayapo myth on the origin of cooking fire. We learn from this not only the value that David saw in the anthropological study of myth, but the huge influence that Turner had on his thinking and his approach. Terry was for David what David is for many of us, someone with, quote, a remarkable ability to make still extremely complicated ideas sound like matter of fact common sense, and even to render them fairly straightforward, unquote. As David laments, what Terry Turner could do in person, however, in no way corresponded to his written work. As we similarly found, uh, when we began preparing this paper, Terry Turner's writing was impenetrable. David himself admitted that. Initially, he did not understand a word of Turner's work. Once he understood it, however, he began, he came to regard Turner as the most underrated social theorist of the last 50 years, and the fire of the Jaguar as one of the greatest achievements of anthropological theory that should deserve a place among the classics. We dug deeper and to, our, and to our surprise, we came to see Turner in much of David's thinking and in his approach to anthropology. Given David's political life, his interest in myth seems surprising. In a pedigree that goes, to Machea, goes from Machea Eliade to Jordan Peterson, the study of myth has traditionally been the province of the politically conservative. Though there are a variety of ways, a, a variety of approaches to myth among them, for many, myths either reflect universal structures of the human mind or they resolve contradictions related mainly to individual experience. They have no direct relationship to social organization, let alone to social transformation. But what David saw in Turner was quite the opposite, a rare progressive theory of myth, he put it, where myth emerges as the embodiment, if not as the paragon of human collective creativity a reflection on the different ways we choose to organize ourselves and the similar ways we reproduce those forms. In what follows, we examine these connections. We show how this argument originates from a radical rethinking of structuralism, and we consider how it came to fashion David's way of doing anthropology. 
But first, a few words on the fire of the jaguar. The fire of the jaguar is the most prominent myth of the Kayapo, uh, an Amazonian group who carried on their research for over 50 years. The myth recounts the story of a young Kayapo boy who is adopted by jaguars, who then teach him how to use cooking fire, knowledge that he brings back to the Kayapo community. From a standard point of view, the myth seemingly explains how Kayapo attained full, full sociality out of nature, a process that, that is reflected in the manipulation and then replication of fire. The myth features a complex pattern of transformations, uh, each corresponding to appropriate actions and behavior in, behaviors in Kayapo society. This ultimately fosters an awareness of actions uh, and how to adapt these this inappropriate ways to reproduce the social order. Turner's, Turner's analysis of this myth is probably the most detailed analysis of a single myth in the anthropological literature. It is structuralist in character, but very different and, in David's view, much more compelling than the structuralism of Levi Strauss. Unlike the latter, Turner is not interesting, interested in comparing different myths to reveal an underlying code. Rather, he embeds his analysis of myth in Kayapo's socioeconomic organization, uh, which he knew very well. What he argues is that the mythical development of the life um, of a boy reveals a model not only for the socialization of youth, but also for the consolidation of Kayapo society as a whole. In Kayapo matrilocal communities, men must undergo an emotional disruptive process of detachment as they move from the, their natal home to the communal men house, and finally, finally to the house of their in-laws. By recounting parallel processes of detachment, the myth of the fire of the jaguar reframes the tensions and contradictions of this experience. In so doing, uh, myth functions as an important means whereby societies are able to shape behavior into collectively prescribed organizational patterns. Ultimately, Turner suggests the Kayapo myth and social organization stand in a relation of circular causality with one another. He arrives at making this argument. Uh, he arrives at this argument uh, by making a fundamental move away from Levi Strauss's structuralism. The minimal units of myth in his analysis are not categories, uh, types of beings or type of objects, but actions. The difference between categories and actions is that actions, when repeated, force you to con consciously acknowledge a pattern. And that's ultimately what structure is for Turner. This is a pattern of action, or in his words, a group of transformations uh, bounded together by invariant constraints. This type of structure, however, is always dialectic. As soon as the pattern itself shows this diversification, you're forced to uh, create a higher level of abstraction in order to account for and compare differences, which in turn can lead to yet another higher level and so on. Turner takes this idea of dialectical structure and related vocabulary from Piaget and cybernetics. His adapt adaptation of these theories into anthropology might be at times counterintuitive or difficult to follow. For David Graeber, it is central. And in this forward, to clarify what Turner wants to say, he offers the following example. Consider the action of giving food to a child. The moment you do this twice, but with the understanding that it is the same action you performed before, you generate through repetition a kind of hierarchy, since there is a, a more abstract level at which those actions are both token of the same type. But the moment you say, um, one says a different kind of repeated action is not the same, say giving food to a husband or to a rival at a competitive feast, one is generating a third level where differences, different types are being compared. At the same time, by defining certain types of action this way, one is ge typically generating certain identities like child, husband, or rival, kinds of person who typically perform such actions, uh, which in turn leads you to consider or yet a higher level of analysis, how these identities relate to one another and so forth. Structure in short is always dynamic and open-ended and always develops for lower level structures, uh, actions, sorry. Turner applies this analysis to both Kayapo social organization and the myth of origin. Overall, Turner claims to have demonstrated that at least among the Kayapo, the dynamic structures of myth and social, organ social organization parallel one another. Turner, uh, one of Turner's central theoretical arguments in the fire of the Jaguar is that what we usually consider mythical thoughts the central message of myth, tops the highest level of social organization. Essentially, the function of myth is to contain this potentially never-ending dialectical process. At some point, the complexity of social reality of why we treat one another the way we do, or why we value certain actions over others, 
become such that we are unable to form a higher level of abstraction to account for it. What MID does is preempting the need to construct that level because it treats contradiction in the structure of society as playing out within the terms of that structure itself. For Turner, all of this explain, also explains the reason why most myths are about the origins of social institutions. In order to avoid having to consciously create a higher level of ourselves, we attribute the origin of social institutions to a mythical power in the distant past. And this is why the Kayapo, for instance, regard the very power to create and maintain the social order, the fire, as originating from the, an extra social source, the jaguar. To sum up, Turner's structuralism uh, makes ra a radical departure from levi strauss because first, uh, it takes actions rather than ideas as starting points. Uh, nature and society are not static categories, but emerge as modes of action, uh, modes of action, uh, modes of action con uh, continuously in tension with one another. The myth, in short, does not reflect static aspects of society, but the processes through which these aspects uh, are produced and maintained. It reflects the dynamic structure, that is. Um, second, it takes the perspective of the subject rather than, than of the analyst. And these are the tensions and processes lived by the Kayapo, which shape their values and subjectivity and the production of society. It may help to turn briefly away from Turner and consider the argument from the perspective of the trickster, a common figure in myth. If you adopt the, po the popular approach to myth, which focuses on essence or nature or things as they are, then we see the trickster as representing an irresolvable contradiction between personal desire or freedom and social commitments. If you adopt the approach advocated, advocated by Turner, which focuses on how things come to be or with the effects of their actions, then we see the myth resolving these tensions by, by showing that freedom and the, and the satisfaction of person, personal desires depends upon the care that comes from living socially. To commit oneself to the social is therefore to ensure one's own freedom and the satisfaction of one's desires, not once, but over the course of one's lifetime. It is hard, of course, to give justice to the complexity of Turner's thoughts on myth in a few paragraphs. We have offered but a glimpse of it. We hope, however, to have given a sense of how these ideas have been so important for David, the causal significance of myth, the focus on action, the emphasis on social production, the conscious creation of structure, the very idea of dynamic structuralism. David endlessly reworked these ideas throughout his writing. The aspect we are most interested in focusing on, however, is that of social creativity. Myth, in Turner's view, is the creative end product of a dialectical process, which enables a system of social relations and eases social integration. In their capacity to give support to different types of social organization, it is therefore possible to see the variety of myths we find across cultures as a vast compendium of human creativity. But, and this is something David finds particularly curious, myth is also creativity turned against itself. Most myths are about how latter-day humans can't be genuinely creative anymore. They so often appear to be about the fixing of either natural differences or social relations. The Kayapo offer a good example of this. The creation myths of Juntra or Hong speakers, among whom I did fieldwork, are another good example. They speak of a time when different beings had no fixed form and of how, and this is significant, humans then branded the animals with fire to give them their distinctive characteristics and set in place the relationships between them. It is natural here for both Turner and Graeber to turn to Marx's idea of alienation, because so defined, myth does appear to be a form of alienated self-consciousness. In other words, we create our physical worlds, but we are unaware of, and hence not in control of, the process by which we do so. As Turner puts it, myths appear to present us with the form of the natural universe, and this form is then seen as self-existing prior to any particular instance of human social activity. In other words, you appear to be presented with the way things are, not with the way with how they came to be. And in the process, you confer upon that which you yourself, you confer power upon that which you yourself created. There is clearly a potential dark side to it. As Marx argues, there is a necessary link between humans' misunderstanding of the process of their own creativity and forms of authority and exploitation, 
Now, one of the problems in seeing things this way is that from an anthropological perspective, one risks being condescending to people like the Kayapa. Are we really prepared to say that the Kayapa live under a form of alienated consciousness? David reflects on this dilemma in a number of places, most explicitly in his criticism of the ontological term. His take is twofold. First, he writes, the dilemma changes as soon as we realize that we frequently criticize our colleagues, our colleagues' own assumptions about the workings of society. Denying the possibility of saying that the Kayapa are wrong in their own assumptions would amount to denying their status as potential intellectual peers. Second, though certainly capable of questioning the foundations of their own thought and actions, we should not assume that they are questioning the foundations of their own thought or actions or that there's any particular reason why they should. As Turner points out, the Kayapo quote, are fully conscious of constructing themselves and their society through myth. We see this same phenomenon in David's writing on fetishism, drawing upon ethnographic research from West Africa from, from the 17th to the 19th century. He writes that fetishes from the West African viewpoint are not simply objects that are presumed to have power over us. They are objects recognized as creations. In other words, as embodiments of intentions and actions that have power over us. These, like myths, can embody social creativity because they have the power to establish new relations. The danger comes when we take this power as fact. When, quote, when fetishism gives way to theology, the absolute assurance that the gods are real. The assurance, in other words, that such power is immutable. Similarly, with myth, the danger comes when we elevate myth as fact. When we do this, we risk losing sight of those moments, as Turner puts it, when the forms we take as natural or given are in fact the identity of human agents, and to this end might actually be transformed. In many of his writings, in many of his writings, David states that this is the condition we find ourselves in now. We forget, as his popular line puts it, that the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something we make and could just as easily make differently. He and David Wengro reflect at length on this point in The Dawn of Everything. They show how our Enlightenment myth of origin takes the linear growth of social complexity and hierarchy as natural or given. Curiously, where virtually all other origin myths start with a creative event, with the branding of animals or the mastery of fire, the Enlightenment myth appears to start with nothing and seems to negate the possibility of social creativity entirely. This brings us to the final section of our paper, where we reflect on David's scholarly efforts to challenge our own contemporary myths and their social effects. So, um, David saw anthropology as a dialogic enterprise, driven by the willingness to turn to others to challenge the evaluated assumptions or myths that color our own experience of the world. He knew that anthropologists cannot take a view from nowhere, as philosopher Thomas Nagel puts it. As all social scientists, um, they labor under the weight of their own culture-specific assumptions. Some of David's, con David's contemporaries, most notably those aligned with the writing and culture turn, as well as post-structuralist and post-humanist scholars, saw this as a damning indictment of the impossibility of anthropology as an objective science. For David, uh, it was his main strength. It is precisely by turning it to ethnography, specifically to comparison, that we, saw it that we see it possible to challenge our own myths. And it was in this guise that anthropology was most valuable for him. Um, how does the dynamic structure its mentor turn a fit into this? As we have examined, one important difference between structuralism as espoused by Levi Strauss and dynamic structuralism is that the former takes mythology to have, quote, no obvious practical function and no direct link to social reality. The latter, the latter, to the contrary, takes mythology not only to reflect the structure of social relations and appeal in concrete, effective terms to those who listen to them. They are, uh, they are, as Turner puts it, quote, powerful devices for supporting a given form of social organization, end quote. If you assume a relation of circular causality between myth and social organization, then this has obvious political implications. Um, if you can change one, you have a high chance of changing the other. Whether this circular causality between myth and social organization is actually in place can be questioned. But David is convinced that there is. It turns to our contemporary myths to draw attention uh, to their consequences and to challenge them. 
Ernesto De Martino once wrote that the task of anthropology lies in the possibility of positing problems whose solution leads to an expansion of the self-consciousness of our own civilization. Only then can anthropology help the formation of a wider humanism." End quote. With some reservations of the, on the term civilization, David Graeber will surely embrace this spirit. Once he said on Twitter, I am bored of post-humanists. I think I am a pre-humanist. Humanity is something we aspire to achieve at some point in the future. But David would also add that, though anthropology is uniquely placed to fulfill this role, the aspiration to achieve a wider humanism is by no means exclusive to the society that invented anthropology. In one way or another, it has been the primary moving force of all cultures. In his Marilyn Stratton's lecture, he argued that what we call cultures should be seen as examples of a successful social movement, particularly as the outcome of a creative process of refusal. Indeed, it is not a coincidence that many ethnonyms, uh, the name uh, a culture gives to itself, actually mean human, suggesting perhaps that they see themselves as having achieved that stat that such a status. The dawn of everything considerably expands the argument of the starting lecture. Faber and Wenger not only engage in their own process of creative refusal, refusal challenging, enduring enlightenment myths and their socially deleterious effects, they show that the role of uh, they show that, that the role that creative refusal and conscious social experimentation has placed throughout human history. Some early critiques of the book have asked, have asked for unpacking the term conscious social experimentation. Perhaps in and of itself, the term does evoke the idea of a group of people getting together and rationally imposing their will on the world. In light of what has been, has been discussed in this paper, however, we suggest that the rubric of conscious ex experimentation certainly can, without contradiction, uh, involve forms of myth, myth making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I now hand over um, to Michael before we discuss the two. Michael Edwards, over to you. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Alpa. Um, yeah, I'm really happy, obviously, to step in. It's such a, an honor to speak about David in this setting. Um, what I'm going to, to read is, is also a work in progress, and it's a short version of a, a chapter that will be coming out in a volume organized around David Graeber's anthropology and edited by Holly High and, and Josh Reno. And the, the piece is called Forward Thinking, Reading a Revolution in Myanmar. So I would never have expected Ruth to join the revolution. But then so much of what's happened in Myanmar this year has been somehow unexpected. From the coup itself in the early hours of the 1st of February to the scale of the popular reaction. Friends who expressed little interest in politics or protest during my field work only a couple of years ago have been in the streets. Striking has been the role of young women, women like Ruth a Christian born in the Chin Hills who works at a church in Yangon where I did much of my research. As the uprising grew through February, Ruth's posts filled my Facebook feed. Selfies in COVID face masks amid swelling crowds around the Sule Pagoda, memes mocking the generals behind the coup, photographs of victims shot by security forces. One thing not surprising has been the brutality of the crackdown. As it intensified in late February and early March, Ruth's post showed her wearing not just a face mask, but also a helmet and goggles. As Pentecostals, believers like Ruth have also been praying. One video streamed via Facebook Live had about 20 members of her church engaged in a session of collective prayer, entreating God to save Myanmar. Such prayers were commonplace during my field work, but this one resonated with the revolution then building momentum in the streets. Put to the rhythm of a familiar call and response chant made famous in the 1988 uprising, the prayer replaced the usual rejoinder, do ye, do ye, or our cause, our cause, with amen, amen. What draws Ruth and others so fully into the revolution through protest and prayer? There's been much said about how a decade's experience of a more open public sphere makes return to military rule impossible to countenance. 
Many have also remarked on how this moment has transcended lines of difference that have long animated Myanmar's politics with Chin Christians and even Rohingya Muslims manning barricades alongside majority Burman Buddhists. But maybe part of an answer also lies in the imagination. And I say this because of another question I've had watching Myanmar's spring revolution unfolding from afar. What would David Graeber make of this? Graeber never wrote about Myanmar, but he was of course deeply interested intellectually and practically in revolution in Rojava and elsewhere. And for him, the question of revolution was tied up with a question of the imagination. In Revolutions in Reverse, he distinguishes a transcendent form of the imagination, the terrain of fiction and make-believe of imaginary creatures, imaginary places, imaginary friends from an imminent form, one not static and free floating, but entirely caught up in projects of action that aim to have real effects on the material world. It was the latter form of imagination that interested him in the context of revolution. And in the essay, Graeber contrasts an ontology of violence, where being realistic means taking into account the forces of destruction, with an ontology of the imagination, grounded in the idea, to use his oft quoted formulation, which we, we heard just now, that the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. Now, while Graeber never wrote about Myanmar, had he not died last September, that wouldn't have remained true for long. Some years ago, he agreed to, to write the foreword to a new edition of Edmund Leach's Political Systems of Highland Burma. The foreword was never finished, so we can't know what Graeber would have written. We can't know how he would have engaged with Raymond Firth's original, somewhat laudatory foreword. We can't know how he would have dealt with Leach's later reappraisal when he acknowledged that he'd somewhat essentialized Gumsa and Gumlao, the Kachin categories famously at the heart of his analysis. We can't know how he would have situated the book in relation to debates in anthropology in the decades since, or how he would have dealt with critiques that have been directed towards it, including from Kachin scholars, and especially amid growing calls to meaningfully decolonize the study of Myanmar. But what we do know is that Graeber was a fan. Edmund Leach, he once wrote, may have been the man who most inspired me to take up an anthropological career. Leach was for Graeber, a model of intellectual freedom. References to Leach appear across Graeber's body of work, including citations of the younger Leach and the older Leach following his so-called conversion to structuralism, a break which as Chris Fuller and Jonathan Parry note has probably been overdrawn. Not only are there striking continuities in the sort of questions Leach asked of Dada, they write, and the sort of, and the sort of answers he offered, but more importantly, he kept faith throughout his career with one broad vision of the anthropological enterprise. Now, if the same might be said of Graeber, it's not the only way in which the two men were similar. Both thought across relatively long stretches of time, 140 years in the case of Leach's study of the oscillations of Kachin political systems, millennia in the case of Graeber's work on debt and his recent collaboration with David Wengro. Both were also prolific and lucid writers, eager to engage audiences beyond anthropology, including incidentally via the BBC, which broadcast Leach's Wreath Lectures in 1967 and Graeber's 12 part series on debt in 2016. What James Laidlaw and Stephen Hugh Jones write about Leach could just as easily be said of Graeber that the lessons of anthropological inquiry were relevant to the everyday moral and political questions that were being debated all around him. Both were also interested in the micro and macro forces that impacted the production of knowledge in anthropology. And both reflected on how their own biographies and albeit extremely different insider outsider positions shaped the work that they produced. There are, however, few references to political systems in Graeber's corpus, which raises another question. What would he have written in this foreword? It's impossible to give a definite answer. Graeber was far too creative for that, but it's probably not going too far out on a limb to suggest that imagination might have been a central theme. For what are the political categories of Gumsa and Gumlao analyzed by Leach, if not products of the imminent mode of the imagination that interested Graeber? One reference that does appear at points throughout Graeber's writing is to, a, is to remark Leach made in his short 1982 treatise simply titled Social Anthropology, 
There, Leach suggests that the distinction between humans and non-humans is not that the former have a soul, but that they're able to conceive or imagine that they have one, and thus that it's imagination, not reason, that sets humans apart. If imagination is, for Leach and Graeber, a general feature of the human condition, it's also one thrown into relief at certain moments, like moments of revolution. When one tries to bring an imagined society into being, Graeber wrote, one is engaging in revolution. It's maybe not too much of a stretch then to also imagine that if he'd been writing the forward to political systems this past year, Graeber would be attending to the revolution underway in the valleys and the highlands that feature in Leach's book. A revolution whose participants, like Ruth, imagine not just a political system in Myanmar with the military no longer in charge, but a society transformed in myriad other ways. Around 2011, as Myanmar started to emerge from five decades of military rule, Ruth's church and other Pentecostals intensified their evangelism efforts, seeking to win converts in a country where about 90% of the population are Buddhist. Taking advantage of the political opening and with an eye to the spiritual rupture it was thought to herald, these Christians began to preach more energetically than they had in years. Even before the coup, there was evidence that the rupture might not be forthcoming. A sense that liberalization was benefiting only well-connected cronies, new forms of censorship impinging on what was supposed to be a newly open public sphere, an ascendant Buddhist nationalism rendering increasingly precarious the position of minorities and playing out most horrifically in the treatment of the Rohingya. There are also a few signs that Buddhists were suddenly interested in Jesus. Though this did little to dent my friend's commitment to evangelism, God works in his own time was the frequent refrain. How in this understanding to make sense of the coup? The immediate days after the military seized control, detaining elected leaders, including Aung San Suu Kyi, were strangely quiet. Healthcare workers and teachers were among the first to go on strike. Garment workers followed soon after. As the civil disobedience movement took shape, more people took to the streets. By the middle of February, tens of thousands of protesters were assembling each day in Kledan, a busy commercial neighborhood near Yangon University. Ruth was among them. We'd been in touch since the hours following the coup. She sent photos and videos of the swelling crowds. In one image, her white sneakered foot stamps on a poster of the face of Min Online, the general behind the coup, taped to the pavement for protesters to walk over. In another, she holds up a placard with the words, justice for Myanmar. Young people will not be turning back, she wrote in one message. A series of photos posted in late February on Chin National Day shows Ruth wearing the traditional black, red and green associated with the part of the Chin Hills where she was born. The spokesman for the parallel government established by the parliamentarians deposed by the coup has been a prominent Chin Christian doctor, Dr. Sasa. At certain points, protest signs featuring his face seem to eclipse those featuring Aung San Suu Kyi's. In late February, Ruth posted an old photo of her with Dr. Sasa with the caption, may the Lord bless you and use you for our nation and for his kingdom. Dr. Sasa's role has been particularly important to my Chin friends, accustomed like other ethnic minorities to being treated like second-class citizens, if citizens at all, by a state whose leadership has been dominated by Burman Buddhists. The literature on ethnicity in Burma has often been in dialogue with Edmund Leach, for better and for worse. His arguments in political systems are so well known to anthropologists that they hardly need repeating. His analysis of the oscillations between political categories, the hierarchical Gum Sa and the egalitarian Gum Lao is de deployed to attack the equilibrium assumptions of his structural functionalist colleagues and their allied tendency to treat ethnic groups as bounded units. Social systems, Leach argues, do not correspond to reality. They are models used by the anthropologist and by those they study to impose upon the facts a figment of thought. Such models find their clearest expression for Leach in myth and in ritual, which present the social order in its ideal form, conjuring it by acting as if it already existed. Such a model, importantly, does not float fr freely from the messy world of social facts. It can never have an autonomy of its own. 
Critics of Leach have honed in on his nonchalant confession towards the end of the book that he's frequently bored by the facts. This attitude they charge means that his analysis floats more than a little too freely. One might, with justification, write Mandy Sedan and Francois Robin, accuse Leach of reducing the Kachin sphere to a kind of intellectual laboratory without any expression in reality because of the way in which he molded his case study to a theory rather than the other way around. I'm sure Graeber would have dealt with these criticisms in his foreword, but less certain what he would have said about them or how his own view of the relationship between facts and theory would have shaped his assessment. My main hunch though, is that Graeber would have devoted much of the foreword to what Leach tells us about the as if, that otherwise glimpsed in ritual and myth, but also firmly tethered to social action. Such an otherwise, the space of the imminent imagination drew Graeber's attention throughout his anthropology, even when he wasn't using the term. Consider his foreword to another book, The Chimera Principle by Carlo Severi, which deals with the relationship between ritual objects, memory, and the imagination. Graeber praises the book for showing that imagination is a social phenomenon, dialogic even, but crucially one that typically works itself out through the mediation of objects that are to some degree unfinished, teasingly schematic in such a way as to mobilize the imaginative powers of the recipient to fill in the blanks. He goes on to suggest that what Severi shows for the relationship between people and objects has broader implications for the relationship between people themselves. But the focus here on what David Sneath, Martin Holbrad and Morton Peterson might call technologies of the imagination, the conditions from which imagination emerges in an underdetermined form, expresses Graeber's, Graeber's interest in that form of the imagination rooted in social reality. It's also one that, when communicated in the subjunctive mood of myth or ritual, might, to use a word of which Graeber was fond, prefigure realities to come. I think it's likely that it's this element in political systems that Graeber would have homed in on in his foreword, particularly if he'd been writing it this past year, watching the revolution in Myanmar unfold. As the crackdown in Myanmar grew more brutal through March, protesters like Ruth continued to be in the streets. By late February, we'd shifted our conversation from Facebook Messenger to Signal because of the safer encryption that that app offered. Still, Ruth continued to post on Facebook using a private VPN to access the site in the face of the Junta's effort to block it and periodically the internet altogether. Her content grew more graphic in early March, she posted a widely circulated video of three paramedics being beaten by security forces. Videos of shootings followed daily. Her posts were usually accompanied by the slogan, the revolution must succeed. In the months since I first drafted this paper, Myanmar's revolution has continued to evolve. Just as the country ought to be considered world historical, as the historian Jonathan Saha suggests, so those involved in the uprising continue to make history through their ongoing resistance amid a military assault that has been especially vicious in Chin State. What would Graeber have made of this unfolding revolution? Unfolding is the operative term. Every real society is a process in time, Leach famously writes in the introduction to political systems. And as Tambaya suggests, there's much in Leach that resonates with or prefigures perhaps Johannes Fabian's critique of anthropology's routine denial of coevalness. There's an irony then that many of the critiques of Leach's book focus on his elision of the historical circumstances in which his study took place. It's also worth noting that in the 1964 introductory note to the book, Leach has nothing to say about the coup that took place in Burma in 1962 or about the Kachin uprising against the central state, which started one year earlier. It's quite possible, likely even, that Graeber's forward would have gone in a completely different direction to what I've imagined. It's possible that he would have made much more of the charges of idealism, the ways in which Leach's attempts to connect the ideal to the real Apache, the ways in which a gap between the imagination as theory or model and social facts remains, such that the imagination that comes through in Leach is perhaps more transcendent than imminent. 
It's also possible that he would have made much more, as others have, of the place of status-seeking individual action in Leach's analysis, that inheritance from Malinowski. Action stemming perhaps not from an ontology of the imagination, but from an ontology of violence, an ontology recall that foregrounds force and power, and an ontology, incidentally, in which Min Line and others behind the coup and subsequent, subsequent crackdown also seem to be rooted. There are no doubt other reasons for Graeber's admiration of Leach, present perhaps in Graeber's invocation of a certain ideal of an anthropologist at the end of his essay, Anthropology and the Rise of the Professional Managerial Class. An aristocratic ideal who recognizes that what drew us into this line of work was mainly a sense of fun, that playing with ideas is a form of pleasure in itself, an ideal, importantly, that should be open to everyone. There are also echoes relatedly in the style of argument, a style that, may, that might be thought of as revolutionary, not in the Pauline sense of rupture, but in the sense of turning something around or upside down, even if one completely disagrees with the final analysis. A meaning perhaps also captured in part of the Burmese word for revolution, Tolan Yi, with its sense of reversing or turning things over. There are differences and discontinuities too, where Leach, as Laidlaw and Hugh Jones write, seems to have proceeded not from any consistent political opinion, Graeber's immersion in anarchist practice animates much of his anthropology and especially his interest in prefiguration. But another similarity is that Graeber and Leach were not just prolific writers, but prolific readers too. Geertz's answer to the question, what is it that the ethnographer does is that they write. Well, yes, but they also read. Sneak, Holbrad and Peterson asked whether it might be possible to see ethnography itself as a technology of the anthropologist's analytical imagination. Leach, of course, claimed to have written up his Kachin analysis in the absence of field notes, famously lost amid the chaos of war. Notwithstanding what gets said about the power of Leach's photographic memory, we might also ask what kind of imagination did that entail? There's been much said about the place of the imagination in the writing of anthropology, but less perhaps about imagination's role in its reading. If all ethnography is fiction, as Leach claimed in one of his final public lectures, but even if it isn't, what imaginative faculties are engaged in reading it? What modes of speculative reading do we pursue through gaps from afar of Facebook posts of texts that don't really exist? In his foreword to Severi's book, Graeber pushes against the utopian ideal of a text produced by a single unique genius. Instead, he argues, everything turns on a tacit complicity whereby the author leaves the work in effect half finished so as to capture the imagination of the interpreter. A complicity in which this seminar series clearly partakes. How then do we read with an imagination that is a social phenomenon dialogic even, one that works through the mediation of things unfinished and incomplete. Unfinished and incomplete, like Myanmar's revolution, Ruth is also working in the presence of something that doesn't really exist and didn't even in the years of so-called transition, a democratic Myanmar that is both politically and for her spiritually saved. She was doing so even before the coup. But in continuing to defy the military, just as she continued to evangelize in the face of indifference, she and others act as if they live in a world not just where the revolution must succeed, but in which it already has. And in imagining that world, they work to bring it into being. Thanks so much, Michael, for this <clears throat> brilliant paper. Um, it's been such a joy to have all three of you presenting today. And um, I'll just take my prerogative as chair to maybe just start with a question. And I see that there's others in chat. I will invite Nick and Jonah after me. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, Michael, you raised uh, the question of imagination, which was going through my head as Megan and Julia spoke. And I'd like to ask Megan and Julia about the role of imagination, which surprisingly didn't kind of feature in your, in your, presentation at all 
um, the relationship between myth and social organization being this kind of dialectical creative process really is central uh, to what you drew out, but what is the role of imagination there and what is the, what is the relationship between myth and imagination? Um, uh, and, and, you know, how do you differentiate the two um, is, is what I'd like to ask you about. And Michael, yeah, it's really um, this, this, uh, this, the, I remember David getting asked to do um, the, uh, the, the, the introduction to a new volume of um, political systems of Highland, Highland Burma going, um, put, uh, going out and, 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 and this was quite a long time ago. And then um, we had, uh, you know, when David and David were writing The Dawn, I remember sending them about three pages of comments on, on, um, on Leech and why Gumsao and Gumlao didn't feature at all in their, in their analysis. And, um, and then what was really curious, because given, you know, the significance of this movement from hierarchy to hierarchical to egalitarian societies back and forth and, and you know, Morse and the Eskimo was there, but why not? Why not Leech? Uh, and then um, I was even more surprised to find, uh, and I didn't have a chance to ask David about this, you know, in, in the final version of the dawn that Leech isn't there at all. And um, so I wanted to, I guess, maybe push you on this a bit. Like, what I mean, what given the critiques that have come out on, on Leech's work and Leech's own kind of admissions afterwards, I mean, maybe. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe it just became very difficult because in the end, Gumsao and Gumla were myths for um, Leech's version of anthropology rather than anything to do with um, the Shannon Kachin in, in, in Burma. And maybe that is why it became very difficult to write about Leech at all. Um, 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 uh, for the and just it's just a kind of proposition um you know so it's just curious that this forward never got written despite the fact that it was quite quite a few years and David was writing so many other things and the fact that there was no um that there's no mention of Leach at all in the dawn despite the kind of centrality of the of the arguments okay so you're just putting trying to put the two of your presentations in conversation with um with each other um okay and then I will uh hand over to um, Nick first. Do you want to address Thank those? You. Yeah, I'll give Michael yeah, a chance to think. Chance to think. <laughs> um, I think I'm repeating in your, uh, but yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, this, is, this is a really great question about imagination and, and Julio and I actually went back and forth quite a few times because we, we were trying so hard for most of <laughs> when we were preparing this paper to just try to get our heads around what Turner actually says rather than kind of filling in our own bits about what we think uh, you know what Graeber said and how it came from Turner and one of the things that we kind of kept coming up against it was this tension between Turner maybe making an argument about how myth reproduces certain forms of social order versus is another argument which would be that in the process of drawing attention to action in the way that we've kind of described in the paper um that that the you know myth doesn't only, i think we were trying to write it that myth doesn't only reflect uh, given forms of social organization um it actually encourages um or, or fosters kind of reflection on on those forms um, of social organization and then and kind of in, in inherent in that uh, is a process of kind of conscious social experimentation and imagination and so on a kind of creative refusal and we see that much more in David's work I think um, than we do in in Terry Turner's work um, but but, uh, but yeah that's just uh, yeah. perhaps our reading but I don't know if, if uh, yeah I mean um yeah, I mean, David Graeber always always had this critique of what he called the Cartesian imagination, because at some point, so the imagination became sort of detached from sort of a social action. And in a way, a myth like the Kayapo is the exact opposite, because if there is a, a, that sort of circular causality between social organization and myth, it means that the imagination really isn't really um, immaterial, it takes that Cartesian form. So yeah, we, it's definitely a concept that we should uh, it could definitely fit in for sure. Um, yeah. Thanks. 
Yeah, thanks, Alpa. Um, yeah, the question of, of, I guess, yeah, why Leach is kind of left out, maybe. Um, and I think it probably comes back to the to the relationship between facts and theory. Um, I remember, and and other people who would have been David's TA would would know this, but Leach does feature in one lecture in his um, Introduction to Social Anthropology, first year course, um, titled Dynamic Models, I think, and there. Um, Graeber offers, offers up the, the Leach's analysis and then asks the question of whether it might not still, whether it might still be relevant and helpful, even if all the facts are, are wrong, um, in light of critiques of, of Leach that have made been made by by so many um, in the years in the years since. Um, and so I wonder if there's something about the two Davids commitment to some kind of like empirical rigor in this book and the need to really ground their analysis in very solid data that means Leach isn't particularly helpful um, for what they're trying to do there, even if it might be helpful as a kind of a spur to the anthropologist's imagination. Um, there's an interesting, um, in this, this uh, uh, sort of series of reflections on British social anthropology that Leach published called Glimpses of the Unmentionable, he talks about how he was often exacerbated with the empiricism of the kind of the crowd at LSE, Firth and others. Um, but at the same time, he wasn't willing to sort of follow Levi Strauss into, into as at least as he sort of phrased it, um, a position where theory is really all that matters and data is, 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 unimportant, is unimportant. So I think it's maybe if they're somewhat similar on the relationship between kind of theory and data in, in, in the kind of comparative impulse of their anthropology, maybe Graeber was a little bit hesitant to sort of invoke Leach in the service, at least of those more public facing arguments that he's making in, in places like the dawn of everything. Thanks. Thank you. Nick, I'll invite you to ask your question. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for the presentations. They were really great. Um, I have to confess, I've not read The Fire of the Jaguar, so I really appreciated the clarity with which uh, Megan and Julio uh, summarised it. But I was also struck as I was listening by how similar at least some of the aspects of the explanation sounded to elements of uh, Roland Barth on mythologies, uh, which was coming out at the end of the 50s. So would have been in the air, I guess, when Turner was a graduate student and has had an influence ever since. And so I just just wondered how, and particularly there I'm thinking about this idea of um, myth being something that is actually historically situated and constructed and yet nevertheless obscures that aspect of itself by putting forward a supra historical, supra cultural set of claims, um, which of course has then inspired like feminist anthropologists like Shelley Arrington to say, well, we need to kind of um, think more creatively and critically about how we see these kinds of truths when it comes to things like um, mythologies of binary gender. Uh, and that was in the early 90s. Um, so I just wonder how does that genealogy of kind of thinking critically about myth to put forward what I would view as progressive um, emancipatory ways of thinking about the world uh, fit alongside the Turner Graeber genealogy? I mean, was Bath actually an influence on Turner? Was Turner trying to move away from um, that kind of Bathian tradition? Are there things that the Turner Graeber tradition adds or calls attention to that we don't get from Bath. I just wonder how it all connects up within this broader field of um, studies of myth in anthropology and cultural studies. Uh, it sounds like one for the next paper. That is <laughs> but yes, I think, Julia, you want to right, Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, while writing this paper, you always can we talk hard about what the category of myth contains and what really, you know, other strains of literature, literature that comes in. Um, so yeah, we're still thinking about that. Thanks for the question. But actually on the question you ask, um, what, you know, how Bart, Bart fits into it, we actually, we have um, an answer for David himself because um, like a few weeks ago, as we were researching the paper, we uh, encountered this, uh, we came across this- um, Classic uh, Twitter spat. Twitter spat <laughs> with David Graeber in it. <laughs> And uh, Wei was asking whether there are any sort of left wing um, meat theorists, and uh, because usually, you know, Eliad, the Dumezil, the Strauss, the sort of conservative type. And, uh, and someone asked about Barth, and he said that for him, that's a completely different territory because they see his book, which is called Mythology, if I'm not mistaken, um, as sort of an analysis, a semiotic analysis of consumerism and ideology. And so he saw that as very different from say what uh, Levi-Strauss was doing. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it did, but this is the point. It did, uh, it made us question a number of things. First, I mean, firstly, just how, as Julia says, how distinctive all of this is. And um, because there were other parts of the paper where we were writing it and thinking, oh, this sounds like, you know, like the, the sort of focus on action is surely not something that's unique to Terry Turner um, and, and or, or to David Graeber. So, um, and it also got us thinking about this question of like what, you know, we, t we talk about, the kind of contemporary myths, um, and this maybe relates also to to Jonah's question that sort of comes up next, is that we talk about contemporary myths, but you know, are we lumping a load of other things together? You know, what's the di distinction between myth and ideology and and other forms? And I think that David kind of picks up on this. I'm not so I'm not entirely sure how uh, sophisticated the answer is really on the, on the Twitter thread, but um, but it's certainly something that raises those those questions. Um, yeah, to be to be uh, researched further. Thank you, Nick. Um, just to add to that, on the progressive theory of myth, I mean, why not include all those theorists of utopia, which is, you know, a form of myth, right? Um, so it depends on how you define myth. Um, I guess um, that's going to be crucial to how you progress yeah. the paper. Um, okay, um, uh, I'll hand over to Jonah and then to Hans and then Yash Lad. So uh, Jonah first. Thanks. Um, yeah, so during uh, Megan and Julia's presentation, I just wrote this question, which is that maybe you partially answered it already actually, Megan, but I was thinking about common myths in our society now. And one that came to mind was the myth of blitz mentality. Um, and I have actually been, um, I was actually away for the last two years, I'm, so I might have actually got the myth wrong, the kind of meaning of the, the message of the myth, but it seems to fit your description uh, of a myth of social creativity that has now been lost, i.e. the way that people were adaptable during that crisis in, and resilient and how now, in contrast, we're not able to, to act in that kind of way. Um, but this seems like a, a very conservative, a very super unprogressive myth. Um, so I was sort of struggling to put those two together. So can you help me make sense of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, Jonah. And hi, nice to see you. Um, yeah, I think uh, we talk about a progressive study of myth. I know I'm, not, I'm gonna come back to your question, but it's worth uh, raising that point that in the paper, you know, what is progressive uh, is supposed to be the way that myth is approached through a focus on action, basically. Um, but in that section where we talk about the kind of curious relationship between contemporary myths and uh, and kind of virtually all other myths, um, I think what's what's important there is not that the myth itself contains kind of progressive politics necessarily. You know, we were keen to try to explore in the third section that actually myth can have, you know, can be quite regressive, I suppose. Um, but to explore whether a myth um, contains within it the idea, you know, the, that kind of core idea that it's a creation, you know, for, that it's created by people. And then that's, that is progressive, obviously, but it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that the content of myth itself uh, is, is some sort of progressive form. I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but basically that, you know, we can have a myth that, uh, that is really unprogressive and it its politics or regressive in its politics, but that still uh, takes stock of the fact that, you know, these kinds of politics are, are human creations versus, you know, a myth that seems to deny that possibility entirely, which is sort of what is being explored in the dawn of everything. Thanks, that's really helpful. Thanks, Hans. Yeah, I was just reading Deborah's comment. I mean, that's kind of where, where I'm going as well. Uh, I have, I mean, the, my first question is, so where does the imagination come from? I, I'm really skeptical in the way in which you presented it, uh, like circular causation of myth and social organization. I mean, sure, there's a connection, but if it's just a circular causation, what, where does the newness come from, the difference? Is it, is it not just the repetition of the same forever and therefore essentially conservative? I mean, even even Turner, even if it's action, and um, my my point, I mean, to linking this to Leach is Leach is clearly conservative. I, I think it's really kind of I don't know forcing it a lot to to see like progressive elements there. Michael, I know you. There's a quote where you said um, he didn't take any political position. I think that's kind of a typical, you know, 
liberal disguise. So instead of uh, saying, I, I, that's my politics, uh, excusing others of being influenced, he is, sits in, in Cambridge and gives a, a kind of a liberal elite comment on the state of the world, hoping it stays like that and no one rocks the boat. And, and so that is both in his explicit politics, like when he speaks about national politics in the UK, but even more so in his academic and personal politics uh, where, where he excludes lots of others. So, so there's a real difference here um, with the, the way David refers to him in this uh, managerial classes essay where he says, we should all be aristocratic like Leach, but because uh, um, it should be open to everyone. And that precisely is what Leach did not do. He did not open uh, the kind of the imagination to everyone. And in that sense, it's very similar to the way in which uh, Megan and Julio discussed Levi Strauss that the imagination or, or the kind of uh, substantive agency of the, the agents themselves is, is actually excluded and privileged to the analysts. So, sorry, I, I have much more to say and I hope we continue the discussion. Great presentations. Thanks, Michael, do you wanna address that or you can yeah, take Michael, it as a I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't have a lot to say. I mean, Hans, um, Hans and I've spoken about this a, a little bit already. I mean, it's certainly not my, my intention in this paper to present Leach as a, as a progressive. And I think what's interesting about, I mean, that David's admiration of Leach is, is interesting precisely because of the difference in their, in their politics and their position vis-a-vis um, -vis elite institutions and, and, in, and in anthropology itself. Um, I think, I think the other thing, to say, I mean, I think I think that's a good point about the sort of the not not having a consistent political opinion as a kind of example of that kind of the radical centrism or, or what we might call it today. Um, but I do think that maybe what what Leach and, and maybe Graeber draw our attention to is 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 contradiction actually, and 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 the sort of the political contradictions that people hold as as anthropologists and as people and as people who sort of speak on current political affairs in, 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 in the world. And I think you can see that in, in David as well and, and his position vis-a-vis -vis the Labour Party, vis-a-vis -vis the LSE, and then his politics and how, how all this gets kind of held together in, a, in an individual. Um, the other thing to say just briefly is, I mean, of course, this wasn't Leach's view, like Leach in, in, um, spoke of himself as a, a radical at home, but someone unwilling to say anything critical of, of societies elsewhere. Um, so it's interesting, I mean, I think when we've spoken about this before as well, it's interesting to think about it if, if David's uh, ethnography of Madagascar is, is, is kind of critical in the way that you'd, you'd, you'd want sort of Leach to be critical of, of, of Burma, I think that there's questions maybe that we might ask about, about that as well. It's, it's, it's possible that, that Graeber was much more comfortable being a radical at home than he was in terms of, of critiques he might make of, of people in Madagascar and their politics. Thanks. Megan, Julia, do you address this at all? Or? Yep. Uh, yes, yeah. just a, um, a point that Hans raised about the circular causality. Um, I think that, uh, I think Turner there I kind of borrows vocabulary from cybernetics, where circular causality does not, really does not mean sort of the direct correlation. Uh, it, it refers to sort of two levels of self-organizing self systems uh, in, within a hierarchical structure. So changes in one does not automatically, you know, lead to change to the other. So the change, the, the level of influence, kind of uh, level of influence, kind of depends on the on various constraints and structure itself. So, yeah, other, um, we're not suggesting there is sort of a, a, a total correspondence between. I mean, a term is not suggesting that. Um, but yes, uh, without um, that caveat. Uh, okay. Yeah, the language kind of might be misleading. Yeah, I'd make that. Um, I also, yeah, I was when I, we were trying to write this paper, I was trying, and, and sort of why I included the trickster example because it was one that I understood a bit better. Uh, I was trying to understand this relationship between, um, you know, what was going on in the myth and the particular forms of, uh, you know, social organization that were trying to be reproduced or whatever in this in Turner's model. And and one of the things that comes up in his right, he does mention. Um, kind of, he doesn't really explore it maybe enough, or I need to read it a bit closely if I can bring myself to do it. Um, but he refers to the relationship between actions and, um, and social situations. So he's sort of, uh, in a way, sort of providing a space within the myth, or he's talking about myth as providing a space where, um, you know, particular actors can explore 
uh, a range of possibilities essentially that follow from particular actions that are not you know that aren't you know there isn't a, a kind of cause necessary causal relationship between them they might adapt depending on the on the situation and so i was trying to kind of make sense of that and see whether that is a space for for kind of imagination or creativity because it's sort of saying well if you do things in this way it might end up like this or it might end up like this and there's a there's an element of kind of uh, of introspection um that is is sort of passed on to the to the actor themselves to consider you know how their actions might have you know one effect or another and to choose sort of how they behave within that context um i don't know if that helps a bit but there seems to be some space essentially for reflection uh, and introspection and imagination within this uh, kind of exploration of of different possibilities or different consequences of actions thanks there's some helpful comments from um Sid Luckett in the chat and also from Webke Manush, who doesn't have a mic. Um, but for now, I'd just like to uh, give the floor to Yash Lad, please. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the really amazing presentations. Uh, I think my question was about just this connection between uh, the logical hierarchies that uh, we find in the foreword that David uh, talks about, you know, the emergent levels of actions and so forth and uh social or real hierarchies you know and i think like one of the reasons why like donna's description of myth seems to be progressive is because he doesn't net say that like the logical hier hierarchies necessarily always imply like real actual relations of domination between people um so my, my question was just around what do you think to be the relationship between these two types of hierarchies because like I've been trying to write about these ideas myself, and it's that that has been quite difficult to explain to people who are not as familiar with like Turner's work, for example. And I was just curious, for example, if uh, ritual is that domain where like logical sort of cognitive hierarchies get transformed into real ones, but then Turner's idea of myth itself as patterns of action already kind of blurs the lines between myth and ritual, you know. Uh, and then there's another example from philosophy where. Uh, Roy Bhaskar, for example, has this idea of um, uh, meta-reality and demi-reality, but like demi-reality is this world of like impressions and deceptions uh, and so forth, but it's ultimately underpinned by relationships of uh, solidarity, which is what he calls uh, demi-reality. So that's another way to maybe explain how everyday kind of logical hierarchies turn into like real ones. So I was just curious to have your thoughts on like how that process might actually like uh, unfold in real life, you know, uh, how these sort of hierarchies become real ones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I must say I need to think about this uh, a bit more, but um, I do. It does make me think of, of a lot of uh, David's engagements with Dumont, obviously, because Dumont obviously writes a lot about logical hierarchies and and a lot of David's critique is is um, sort of interpreting those in terms of their their um, you know in terms of the actual social hierarchies that they might kind of put in place or or support um, and I do I think he has a, a wonderful section in his possibilities book but also in in the book on uh, in on value sorry uh, where he talks about, um, and this does relate actually quite nicely to, I think, Turner's kind of work and maybe his influence on David, is that uh, it takes uh, looking at a logical hierarchy from the position of the person who occupies that particular, you know, position within the hierarchy uh, for you to recognize whether a logical hierarchy is is a social one you know so he talks about caste and he says you know from the perspective of people at the bottom um you know this doesn't feel like equality at all obviously um so so i don't know if that helps at all but that's certainly something that i've kind of tried to use uh, to make sense of this and i think that um that yeah there are there are lots of other places where it's explored uh, in his work I don't know if you have more to add. Yeah, maybe not on the hierarchy thing, but on the ritual uh, point. This, uh, this is something that we still have to get our heads around. But um, in the preface to the Faraday Jaguar, uh, he talks, he relates uh, Terence Turner to Victor Turner, uh, so theory of ritual, where, uh, you know, Victor Turner talks about, well, drawing from Van Gennep, that sort of, yeah, yeah, 
classic one and Antra 101 and stuff, you know, the, preface, the liminal phase and then there's the transformation. And uh, of course, the, the liminal um, stage where all sorts of symbolic transformations happen, all sorts of weird things happen. And for um, Victor Turner, that's, uh, that's anti structure. For Terence Turner, it would be meta structure. It would be basically a glimpse into a higher level of, of this sort of hierarchy that he's talking about with the structure hierarchy. Um, we, we didn't include that in the paper because uh, although it seems very relevant, I still uh, don't quite grasp it completely, I think. And David is, himself is not being uh, super clear in the preface, but uh, yeah, there, there's, a, there's definitely a connection there. And if I'm not mistaken, Victor um, Terence Turner talks about this in a book chapter called, in a book called Sec Secular Ritual, um, which I read long time ago, but uh, yeah, it might be relevant. Yeah, it might be um, important to look at that chapter for that particular question. Thanks for the, yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. And about, and about back. Sorry, which makes me wonder about the progressive potential of myth, um, Yash's question, because, you know, if you, you, this is it's it's the introduction to Terry Turner and the Kayapo. I mean, doesn't it matter which societies we're considering in relation to myth? If it was, if it was, you know, writing about caste society and the myths myths produced through caste society, we might get a very different um, uh, potential uh, in 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 thinking through myth. I'm, I'm sure this is something that you're you're going to think through or have already thought through. Um, but I will hand over to. Julio, maybe for the last um, last question, there's uh, there's comments also from Deborah, which Hans mentioned in in the chat. But maybe Julio, you can ask the last question, and then we'll we'll go into an informal um, informal seminar. Thank you, thank you, and thank you very much for for your presentation. I I had a question. I think I think also uh, following a bit on what Hans was saying about where does imagination come from. Um, I wonder if you could go a bit more into depth about. The, the relationship between these two political ontologies that David spoke about, so the relationship between imagination and violence. Because, um, you know, the, there is there is so much within this, these two domains, let's say, that uh, you spoke about specifically, Michael, that I wonder um, if you could delve a bit into it. Once I asked David about it, and he told me that <laughs> in his own in a quirky way that, you know, violence uh, at the service of the imagination is popular insurrection an imagination at the service of violence is sort of top-down uh, totalitarianism. So I wonder <laughs> what you what you make of that. Thanks, Julio. I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a question that will, I mean, an answer that will add more than what you've you've just said in your question. I think it's I think it's a really good one because yeah, at several places he juxtaposes the two. Or they're in, they're in opposition in this in revolutions in reverse. Um, the ontology of violence and the ontology of the imagination, but then also in terms of what he says about the lopsided view of, of the imagination, um, in, 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 in the lopsided structure of the imagination at several parts of his, in several places in, in his writing, the two are, are also opposed. Um, so it's a very good question. I'm not sure, yeah, just if, if the, the, the context in which it would be possible or appropriate to think about violence as an expression of of the imagination, or at least of the kind of the imminent imagination that he he talks about. I'm, I don't have a good answer for you, but I wonder if that might appear, for example, in some things that he wrote about Rojava or, 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 or elsewhere. Okay, well, on that note, I'd like to thank very much our brilliant speakers uh, for brilliant presentations, which have raised so many thought provoking issues, which I'm sure we're going to kind of debate and talk about for days to come. So yeah, a really big round of applause for all three of you. And Michael, thank you again for stepping in last minute uh, so valiantly. Um, we're going to maybe just break for a couple of minutes. And for anybody who wants to stay on for an informal open mic, um, welcome back uh, um, or stay on and, and, and we'll be around in a couple of minutes uh, for another 15 minutes or, or so. So um, yeah, lovely to see you all. Thank you everybody for coming to the seminar and part participating and making it so lively and wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you for the questions. Uh.